one. I, I just got distracted here by my phone. Um, uh, Quentin Potaska and Chelsea Potaska just had their little bitty baby, and uh, they're watching online right now. Shout out to Quentin and Chelsea. You guys are awesome. Um, so a lot of babies. I think, I think overall there's about seven, seven babies being born here at the church. Um, that's good. We like babies. Um, I'm just glad that I'm not having any more. Hallelujah. <laughs> I like holding your babies and then passing right back to you. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to go there. Um, <clears throat> uh, one, one more quick thing here before we move into the word. Um, I, I want to give uh, some props to the teenagers this last Wednesday. Um, we went to Fields of Faith at Onalaska High School where close to about 500 students showed up to pray and, admin, and, and to pray for the school, to pray for the administration of the school. Um, and, 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 and I'm going to do this, and, and I want you to take my heart in this. It's not just because he's my son, um, but it's because he's a leader. And I just want to say Caleb Wallace did an amazing job <laughs> leading that thing. He helped organize it, he helped put it together, and he helped lead it, and uh, I couldn't be more proud, especially as a dad. <laughs> Hold it back, Jake, especially as a father, and, um, and I'm very proud of him. <clears throat> he led worship. You, you'll be good to know that our teens represented well at Fine Arts Festival. We, our fine, huh, Fields of Faith, sorry. Um, they, they were the ones that were the loudest, most energetic. And let me tell you, our, our youth group got the whole gym bouncing in worship. It was so much fun. And uh, so we've got a great, great youth ministry here, student ministry. So hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, let's get into the word. Turning your Bibles to John chapter 16, verses 23 and 24. I'm going to go there here in a second. As you know, I've started a sermon series called Attack, Attack. All right, Attack, Attack. Um, and some things, we just need to take the bulls by the horn and just attack them in prayer, attack them in worship, attack them with confidence, attack them in those, especially in the culture and the day that we live in today. You know, there's a lot of things going on, right? I, 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 you know, if, if you at all watch the news, it doesn't take very long to figure out that there's a lot of stuff happening. And, and personally, I don't care which side of the aisle you fall on. It does not matter to me because this isn't about that. It's about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords being in control of all things. Amen. He is in control of all things. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And all we need to do is have confidence and trust in him. You know, there's another word for confidence, and it's called rest. All right, according to the scripture, it's called rest. And when we learn to rest in Christ, when we learn to rest and have confidence in him, I'm not talking about taking a nap. I'm talking about resting in him, knowing that when things don't look the greatest, knowing that God has it under control. And all we need to do is find rest under the shadow of his wing. Come on, somebody. We need to find rest under the shadow of who he is. That's where life is at, is right in there. Yeah, amen. So I want to... I want to talk to you guys today about attacking in prayer, okay? Prayer. Anybody like to pray? Great, that's six of you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we could do a lot with six people. <laughs> prayer, when you break it all down, there's just the, the, the baseline for prayer is just simply communication with God. That, that's really what it comes down to is, is having conversations with him. And sometimes you can have conversations in your mind. Right, and then sometimes you can talk out. Maybe some of you already have conversations in your mind, but not with God, right? You just, you tra does anybody do that? You kind of like talk to yourself. I'll be working and I'll just be like, da, 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 and I'll just start talking to myself and people around me going like, dude, are you okay? Like, is everything okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm just talking to myself. Don't worry about it, All right? <clears throat> so it's, it's just having a conversation with God, but there are certain things about prayer that we can that we can institute and apply to our lives and apply to our, to our, to our walk with God that actually does some damage in the kingdom of darkness um, um, in, in our midst. You, I mean, you guys understand and you do know that there is a battle waging, right? Yes? How many of you guys do, uh, do understand that? That there is a battle waging and, and, and it's coming against. But it, I don't want to make it sound like, oh, no, the enemy's, the enemy's, uh, uh, you know, oh, no, there's so much going on that the devil is winning. No, he ain't winning. Excuse my English. I know ain't in the dictionary. That's my New Mexican coming out. If you didn't know I'm from New Mexico, I can say that. 
He's just not winning. See, when the Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it, it's not talking about Satan coming against us. It's talking about the church going to the kingdom of darkness. And the gates of hell will not prevail against what the church has set in its heart and its mind, what God has instituted for us. Amen? And it comes by us agreeing and coming in alignment with what God has and what he's speaking and what he's doing. Thank God for his word. Amen? Thank God for his word. Think, let me just move this. Thank God for his word. His word is full of promises that are yes and amen. His word is full of the life that we need. And thank God that he still speaks to us today. Thank God that he still has conversations with us today that confirm his word. You can't have one without the other. It confirms the word. So I want to talk to you today about prayer. Well, I wasn't even going to go there. I'm talking about prayer and the joy of breakthrough in prayer. See, I firmly believe that we as believers should see breakthrough, should see breakthrough in our lives when we pray. Amen? See, God's not a liar. He doesn't lie to us. And in John chapter 16, 23, 24, if you don't have your Bibles, you can follow along with me on the screen. It says, in that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you maybe whatever you ask in my name. Kind of whatever you ask in my name. Okay. So what does it say? My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you might receive. No, ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. See, before I move on, I just want to say that when we pray, it's not enough just to pray. I believe that God desires for us to see miracles happen when we ask. Do you believe that? What good is prayer if, if, if things aren't happening when we agree with the Father? What, what good is it just coming and practicing prayer if, if, if we're not seeing movement take place and, and miracles aren't happening and breakthroughs not taking place in our lives? How many of you believe that God wants to see breakthrough happen in your life? Come on. He wants to see breakthrough. When you pray for healing, gosh, I tell you right now, God wants to heal you. We need to come in alignment with the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I'm, I, I, I'm, you have to, I have to apologize for getting a little fired up, but I'm not really apologizing. I'm just saying that to be nice, right? Um, because because I, I, I'm tired of a, of a powerless church. I'm tired of a powerless uh, church walking around the world, not seeing things happen for the kingdom of God. He wants us to see breakthroughs and miracles and things take place in our lives to prove that he is God. Yes, be nice to one another. Yes, smile at one another. Yes, love on one another. Yes, do all those things. But yes, be a display of the power of the Holy Spirit in your lives and in your businesses. Especially in your businesses, in your practices, at the gym, at the, <laughs> at the grocery store, at Walmart, wherever the case is, be a display of who the Father is. See, I think where us as believers including myself, where we get it wrong, is we're praying for what we already possess. See, when you pray for what you already have, you never have the joy of seeing it answered because we're not aware we already have the answer. You see, prayer is designed to be one of the priority categories in a believer's life. How many of you agree with that? See, obtaining answers and getting breakthrough is supposed to be the ongoing source of joy for the believer. The Bible again says, ask and you will receive so that your joy and your joy will be complete. Obtaining answers, seeing breakthrough is supposed to be the ongoing source of joy for the believer. See, if we do not get our joy, hear me out here for a second. If we don't get our joy from breakthrough, then we have to get our joy from the discipline of prayer. Now, hear what I'm saying. I, I'm not going to talk bad about the discipline of prayer. Because I think it's important, especially for Christians and believers' lives, to have some disciplines in your life. Amen? To learn how to do your devotions and read and pray every single day. That's how you nurture yourself. That's how you grow. All right? That, that's, how, that's how you connect with God. See, but when we find our joy 
in the discipline of prayer, we begin to celebrate form rather than breakthrough. We celebrate form rather than substance. And that right there, guys, is the beginning of the formation of a thing we call religion. It's the formation of religion. You see, religion, fleshed out in Scripture, is having the form of godliness, but not having its power. Do you hear what I just said? It's having the form of godliness and not having its power. And not having its power. I'm sorry to, to, to maybe rub against something that, that maybe you've held to, but I'm not interested in just coming to church just to come to church and just say, I went to church on Sunday. I want to meet with the powerful Jesus Christ when I come here on Sunday mornings, amen? That's what it's about. It's about us surrendering to him to, to, to bring our week back into alignment. Man, I went to the chiropractor last week. It was so awesome. So great. Then he did some little therapy on my show. Oh, Jesus, it was so good. Right? And there's just something about getting straight. You know what I mean? There's just something about going, boom, I'm in alignment. I, 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 I see what God has. I, I, I know what he's doing. I, 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 can, I can feel him. There's just something about, 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 about getting centered in the presence of Jesus. And that's what our Sundays do. That's what happens when we come here on Sundays. Praise the God. All of you are here. Some of you are new. Some of you are checking us out. Whatever the case is, it doesn't matter. What matters is, is that you're together here with some believers who love Jesus. And what we want to do is just worship him and come into alignment. You see, religious prayer starts by becoming a people that have to derive satisfaction into the form of prayer. For instance, we put so many hours in in prayer. We've done so many fasts. We've done this and we've done that. See, when we do these things, we deem ourselves as devoted to the Lord. I'm a devoted person to Jesus Christ because I pray, because I fast, because I do this. Let me tell you, your work is this what does the Bible say? Filthy rags. Your righteousness is this filthy rags. See, we don't pray and fast because we have to. We pray and fast because we want to. It's the Spirit of God, and it's, and it's, and it's Jesus calling us to himself. It's the reason why we, we pray and we have relationship. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm not bagging against discipline. Yes, have those things in your life. But what I'm saying is don't allow the discipline of prayer to be the reason why you pray. Allow the, the Holy Spirit and allow Jesus to drive to have a passionate relationship with him. Be the reason why we come to the Father. You see, when Jesus decide, designed this thing called prayer, he designed it that whatever you ask in my name, I'm going to do it for you so your joy may be complete. You see, joy is a priceless commodity, right? And I, and I don't even think that I fully understand its price and how much weight it really carries. I don't, I don't really think that most Christians understand how priceless joy really is. You know, joy is so precious that Jesus was paid with joy as a gift from the Father when he sacrificed himself on the cross. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says this, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Joy was the gift that was given to God, that was given to Jesus when he sacrificed on the cross. That's how much weight joy carries in your life, in your life. You know, I love what the Bible says when it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. You see, most of us want more strength to endure our hardships during our life when really what we need is a Holy Ghost invasion of joy on our hearts. What are you talking about? What are you talking about, Willis? We need joy to be the center of everything that happens in our life. You understand that God is the center, I get it. But joy praying, seeing answers, breakthroughs happening in our lives. Being joy-filled is what gives us strength, not just to make it, not just to survive, but to thrive another day. But to get up, 
with the offensive mindset in your heart going, I am going to, I am going to tackle this world. I am going to go to work. And no matter what happens at work, no matter who's talking, no matter who's saying stuff, no matter how bad of an environment is, I will not allow that to dictate the way that my walk with God is going to go because greater is he who is in me than he that is in this world. And so now I'm going to live joy-filled every single day that I wake up. See, your breakthrough in prayer is supposed to be the resource that brings continuous, ongoing fullness of joy in your life. Our problem is, is that we continue to pray for what we already possess. And if I pray for what I already possess, but live in ignorance of what I already possess, then we never experience the pure joy of the breakthrough in prayer. Here's what I mean. How many of us have ever prayed before, God be with us today? You ever afraid of that before? God be with us today. God be with us today. Which I understand that that's a great prayer to pray. I understand that that's, that's something that we should pray. Right? I, I, I get it that, that that's something that we, that we as normal Christians say, okay, God be with us today. But the reality is, is that you already possess God with you today. Because what's his word say? What we're doing is when we pray those kinds of things, we're contradicting already what he said. His word said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. See, we're praying what we already possess in our hearts. We're already praying with what we already own that was paid for us on the cross. We're, we're praying, and, 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 and what we're doing is, 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 is we're, counter, we're counteracting what God already did for us. Rather than saying, God, be with us today, let's get in alignment and say, thank you, Jesus, for being with me today. You see the difference? Instead of saying, God, be with us, God's already with us. Do you hear what I'm talking about? God's already with us. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us. I encourage you in the morning to wake up and before your feet hit the floor, you say, Jesus, thanks for being with me today. Thank you for not, oh, brother, time to make the donuts. <laughs> Anybody remember that commercial? Time to make the donuts, right? Instead of time to make the donuts, wake up with joy in your face with a hallelujah in your heart, and you say, thank you for being with me today, Jesus. Thank you for being with me today. See, you already possess him and who he is. And what we do is when we learn to be thankful for what we already possess, we become more God aware of what we already have. See, when we pray, when we pray in that way, we're actually doing his warring with the promise he's already given us. Matthew chapter three, verse 13 through seven says this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you, do you so come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then Jesus, and then John consented. Verse 16, as, G, as soon as Jesus was baptized, this is so good, guys. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting, which another word for that in other translations is remain, okay, uh, remaining on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with, with him I am well pleased. Everyone we're tracking with me the story where Jesus gets baptized and he gets launched into ministry? See, the original language, then heaven opened, that word opened, the, 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 the original translation and, and, and the definition for the word open literally means to tear. It means to tear. Jesus tore open the heavens. He tore open the heavens on that day when he was baptized. And then what happened? Then a dove came down, right? The Holy Spirit came down. It's the same prayer that Isaiah prayed when he says, rend the, the heavens. It's the same exact thing. It's the same exact word. It means to tear open. What happened in the Old Testament, Jesus fulfilled in the New Testament. Come on. What, what, what Isaiah prayed in the Old Testament, Jesus was the answer to what Isaiah prayed. Ren the heavens, Jesus came on the scene. Boom, heaven was completely open. Isn't that awesome? You see, Jesus was baptized. The heavens were torn open. The Spirit of God was released on Jesus, and an open heaven was created. When we pray, if we do not know what we possess, we will continually pray and never feel like God is answering. Have you guys ever felt that way before? Where God's not answering your prayer? He wants us to become aware of what we already have. 
And if this is true, and if this story is true, and if all the things line up where heaven was torn open and all these things take place, what that literally means is that to this day, right here, right now, sitting on October 14th, right here in 2018 at River of Life Church, you and I are walking under an open heaven. If that really is true, then you and I are walking under an open heaven. And why in the world would Jesus not want to answer every single thing that you come to for in his name? Now, I'm not talking about God bless me with a new bend so I can roll deep. Sorry for my gangster talk. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this, when your heart's aligned with him and you begin to ask for things and begin to, 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 to be in his name and begin to speak and begin to pray for what he's got on his heart to pray for, God wants to take care of it. He wants to answer for it because you and I, my friends, are walking literally under an open heaven right now. See, Jesus was baptized. The dove came down and ascended on him. And the word remained is so key in this verse. Such a key word. And he remained. See, the Holy Spirit is in all of us. But is the Holy Spirit on all of us? There's a difference. When you get saved, hallelujah, praise the Lord, new man, boom, new spirit, you're a brand new person, amen? The Spirit of God is in you. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's on you. remained on him. What's he on you for? What is that? Why would the Holy Spirit want to be on us? He's on you. Listen to this. He's on you to bring about atmospheric change into the room as you enter. To bring in the power of the Holy Spirit where you walk, where you live, right where you're at. Quick story. I was in Washington, D.C. in 2008. President Obama was getting inaugurated the day after. So you could tell just by thinking that the Washington DC was packed, right? Back then Uber wasn't even alive, we had to get cabs. Couldn't find a cab, we had to walk, it was crazy. I was with a couple of my friends and we went, um, we, we just got done um, uh, ministering at, at a house church called Tom's House, that's what we called it. And uh, it was Tom's house. And so we're in Washington, D.C., about 100 people gathered together in this house. We're worshiping the Lord. It was an awesome time. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., you know that that's a city that never sleeps. As a matter of fact, around 3 o'clock is where all the weirdos come out and all the fun stuff happens. <laughs> Cities are packed. Restaurants are packed. It's about 3 a.m. We walk into this restaurant. I've never had Indian curry before, so I wanted to try it. So we walked into this curry place, and... And in Washington, D.C., there's all ethnic, uh, ethnic food everywhere, okay? So you walk in, it's 3 a.m. Why would a restaurant be open at 3 a.m.? It just was. It's President's Obama inauguration. Everything's good. So we walk in. Waitress sits us down. We start chit-chatting, get our, get our glasses of water. We're ordering food. And this gentleman walks up along with this woman. And the woman approaches us and say, hi, my name is, I'm going to make up a name because I don't remember. My name is Sandra. My friend here wanted to ask you a question. And, he, and I'm like, first thought in my mind is, why isn't your friend talking, right? First thought. My friend here wanted to ask you a question. Well, fire away, you know? Here we are, three of us, three, three guys sitting there at the table. He walks up and he asks us, tell me what you have. Tell me what you have. You might have heard me tell this, tell this story before, but it was so powerful and awesome. He said, tell me what you have. What are, you, what are you on, he asks us. What are you talking about? What are we on? <laughs> you know, thinking that we had some kind of drug or we had some kind of thing or whatever the case is. So we asked him, so why, why are you asking that question? Like, tell us a little bit more about yourself. He said, well, I'm a Satanist. And, and if you've ever met, like, real Satanist people, they're not, like, crazy, right? They're, like, normal people. You probably work with them at your, at your job, okay? They're not, they don't, they're not exuberant. They're not out there. They're just normal people. He says, I'm a Satanist. I believe in Satan. I believe he holds all the ultimate power. But something shifted when you and your friends walked into the restaurant today. He said, you brought a light with you that I'm not familiar with. And I want to know, what, come on somebody, I just got the eebie-jeebies. And he said, I want to know what that light is. He says, I want to know what that light is. 
So we begin to tell him about Jesus. We begin to tell him that we're believers. He's like, if you really, come on, if, if, you, get, if you get confronted with the Satanists, it's the kind of stuff that happens. He's like, if Jesus is really real, then I want you to prophesy over me. Isn't it interesting that, that Satanists even believe in the prophetic more than Christians do? And he says, we want, I want you to say a word over me then. So my friend John then just began to share and began to prophesy over him. And it was so, it was just so head on, like so right on. He's like, there's no way in the world you could have ever known that. And we're like, we know because we carry the light of heaven within us. Prayed with him. He didn't receive Jesus at that time, but man, I believe a seed was planted that day. So think about that for a second. The Holy Spirit is in you so you can commune with the Father. The Holy Spirit's in you so you can have communion and relationship with the Father. But the Holy Spirit wants to be on you so you can rep represent the Father in all the places. He's on you so you can be a conduit of the power of the Holy Spirit right where you're at. You see, if, if, I, had, if I had a dove sitting on my shoulder like Jesus did, see, the goal is, is to become more aware of his presence, amen? It's to become aware of what we already possess, and if I had a dove like Jesus did on, on his shoulder, now if you guys know anything about doves, I used to shoot them at my friend's um, um, farm. Sorry for all your animal activists, I'm sorry. I couldn't pass it up, it was awesome. Also, I ate a goldfish one time too. So, anyway, true story. So, if a dove is resting on my shoulder, you know that doves are very skittish, right? Any movement will set them off, boom, and they'll just take off. If a dove is that skittish, and if I had a dove right here on my shoulder, what I would do is I would be so aware of that dove that I would walk really slow. I would walk really slow with him on my shoulder, paying attention and being aware to the dove's presence on my shoulder. God's idea for you to live a praying, a prayerful life is to be so aware of his presence that you already possess that you walk with his presence everywhere you go. And when the dove, the Holy Spirit, begins to speak anything, you begin to move according to where the Holy Spirit is leading you, where the Holy Spirit is taking you, where the Holy Spirit is doing something in your midst. But you have to become aware of his presence. Do you honestly believe that the Holy Spirit is with you the next time you go to Starbucks? As a matter of fact, if the scripture is true, he's already there preparing good works for in advance for you to do. You hear what I'm saying? He's already there doing stuff for you. He's just waiting for you to be aware of the dove, to be aware of the presence of God. See, we can't afford any longer to think that the Holy Spirit is here just so we cannot do bad things or even just to live right. As I said before, the Holy Spirit is in you to commune with the Father but it's on you to display the Father, to display the power and the love of the Father to the world we live in. Kaylin, if you can come back up, please. So what should we pray for? What should we believe for? We should pray for an increasing awareness of God's presence in our lives and through our lives. See, when we learn to be a host for his presence, our awareness of him becomes tangible and at the forefront of our mind. Everything, everything is directed by his presence. Everything revolves around his presence. Everything revolves around the dove, around the Holy Spirit in you, through you. It's not enough just to say I'm saved so I don't have to do any more bad things. Or I'm saved because now I can be a good person. Yes, those things happen when you come to Jesus. But more than that, now you get to say, I am saved because I'm a display of God's presence to the world we live in every day. I'm a display of his love to everyone that I encounter. It's why we're Christians. It's why we're believers. And some of you might think, and this is okay too, some of you might think, oh, pastor, that's a lot to ask of. It's not a lot to ask to be aligned with the presence of the Holy Spirit for him to speak to you so you can go and accomplish what he's saying to do. When you break down this whole thing called the Christian life, 
It's not about how much you know, it's about how surrendered you are. It's about how obedient you are to him. Listen and obey, for there's no other way. Do you remember that old hymn? Listen and obey, because there's no other way. Some of those people had it down and we get so, we make it so confusing. We make it so, ooh, I can't. We make the Christian walk and the Christian life with God so difficult to live. When the reality is, is you got a relationship, you're in a step-by-step talk with him. See, the awareness of what we attain is a measure we can release. When we realize what we have, we can walk in the new nature he's given us with confidence. Here's what I mean. This is my last illustration. If I've got $5 in my hand, I'll live through the $5 lens. Amen? I'll live like everything is about the $5. Everything is about the $5. Every decision will be made through the $5 lens. Everything that happens in my life will be made through the $5 lens. Not knowing that I have a $20 bill in my pocket. See, if I'm unaware of what I already possess, then all I have is what I have in front of me to look at. And God wants you to make the old switcheroo and live with the $20 awareness, not in the $5 lifestyle. Now, I'm not talking about money. What I'm talking about is this. Let the awareness of what you already obtain be the one to drive your life. Be the presence of God. It's strength. It's joy. It's breakthrough. Let the presence of God in all those things be the thing that drives your mind, your thoughts, your speech, your worship, your job, the reason why you live, where you go to church, no matter what the case is, let the presence of God be the thing that drives the decisions in your life. God wants your family to be in love with him, amen? He wants your children to have successful lives. He wants your children to grow up to be men and women of God because the Lord knows that we need it in this culture. The Lord desires for these things to happen. And as I said a few weeks ago, there's a new generation being born right before our eyes that aren't gonna put up with lame Christianity. They're gonna put up with Christianity that heals the lame. Come on. But that's where you and I come into place. It's really great. See, God desires, let me just finish up. God desires you to be joy-filled in your prayer life, seeing breakthrough take place, miracles happen, so all the above. So if there's anything we can pray, let's ask the Lord to help us align ourselves with what we already possess and ask the Lord to help increase our awareness what those things are. We have to remember that we're on a journey And because we're on a journey, we're not at a destination standpoint. We're not going to point B. You understand that? We're walking with him. We're talking with him. And that's why it's called a relationship with God. Because we're journeying with him. I'm not in this to get somewhere. I'm in it to be with him. I'm in it to walk with him, to talk with him. I want to get to the place where my confidence and my faith grows to the point where I never doubt that when I ask God to do something, that he'll fulfill it for me. Who's with me on that? I want to get to that place. I personally, when I get to that place, that when I ask for God to do a miracle or for for prayer for a healing or, or a financial miracle or whatever the case is, I want to get to the place where I know that when I ask, I shall receive because it's in his name. To see those things happen, to possess to become aware of what I possess already in the the supernatural. So Jesus, I just thank you so much for everything you've done. You're so awesome. God, I bless you with all my heart.